this evening should be English. I will continue in this format for the rest of tonight's lecture. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this performance of J.S. Bach's Suite No. 6 for Violoncello Solo. About nine score and three days ago, I, I think it would behoove me to obtain my spectacles. <laughs> Ah, yes, that is much ameliorated. <laughs> As I was recounting, about six months ago, our Kapellmeister and organist, Johann Sebastian, approached me and presented to me his newly composed manuscript of six suites for the solo build. While doing my best to contain my dubiousness, as the value of not one, but six suites for this instrument, they now refer to as the violoncello, I patiently and respectfully listened to Herr Bach's explanation of his suites. After all, there is no denying the fact that the violoncello's role is best suited for executing bass lines. Everyone agrees that a superior solo string instrument already exists, the viola da gamma. With its multitude of strings tuned in fourths and thirds, and its frets allowing for perfect intonation, its ability to roll chords and sing harmonious melodies remains unmatched in its capacity to please the listener's ear. Yet Herr Johann implored me to remember these facts. We are a simple land, das deutsche Land, and we are a simple folk, die deutsche Volk. Our court here at Curtin lacks sufficient funding to employ both a court gardenist and a court violoncellist. Naturally, I, having been trained on the superior viola da gamma, obtained this position with the requirement that I occasionally perform on the violoncello when the repertoire demands. Thus, I informed our beloved Kapellmeister that I would gladly perform his freshly composed suites. When Herr Bach cautioned me that the sixth suite contains some difficult passage work in a range never before seen on the violoncello, I reassured him that he has no need at all for worry. After all, this violoncello contains a mere five strings, while my gamba has seven. At this point, some of you, or perhaps all of you, may be doubting the validity of this historical account. We know that from the year around 1708 onwards, Bach included violoncello parts in almost every cantata he wrote while living and working in Weimar. Bach's compositional writing and historical accounts confirm that both gamists and cellists were employed at Curtin, where Bach most likely composed the suites between 1717 and 1723. My point is this. Research shows that regardless of whether one was initially trained on the viola da gamba or on the cello, cellists in Germany during Bach's time were at least 50% likely to have played their entire careers using an underhand bow ring. When observing cellists today, either in an orchestra or as a soloist, there is a 100% chance that they hold the bow in the overhand hand. Let us take a look now at figures one and two, which I hope you all picked up alongside tonight's program. In figure one, we see a cellist holding the bow with the overhand style bow grip. And in figure two, we see a cellist holding the bow under, which is the way that gambists hold the bow. The viola da gamba family consists of instruments ranging from treble to bass that are the precursors to the violin family of which the cello is the baritone voice. Once more power and projection were discovered to be present in the violin family of instruments, the viola da gambas, often referred to simply as viols, fell out of fashion. Despite this trend, many cellists who had previously studied the viola da gamba took up the cello, but retained their gamba style of vocal. For example, Martin Berthaud 
who was widely regarded as the founder of the French school of cello playing, and who famously taught the Duport brothers, began his career as a gambist trained in Germany. Upon hearing the legendary Neapolitan cellist Francesco Amorea, affectionately known as Francis Cello, Berto immediately switched to the cello and enjoyed a fantastic career, although it was unfortunately cut short due to an excessive fondness for wine. Berto preserved his underhand bow grip throughout his entire cellistic career, which is especially remarkable given the fact that he died in 1771, and in France, the overhand bow grip took precedence at the beginning of the 18th century. We know that France was the first major country to adopt the overhand bow hold in favor of the underhand, thanks to the composer Georg Muffat, who indicated that the bass instrumentalists ought to hold the bow in the same manner as the small instruments in his Florilegium Secundum for Streisinstrumente, a detailed account of stylistic practices among France, Italy, and Germany during the Baroque period. The necessity for Muffat to instruct cellists to hold the bow as the small instruments do, in other words, with an overhand bow hold, indicates that in Italy and Germany, the cello was played with an underhand bow grip well into the second half of the 18th century. In fact, the overhand bow grip was not universally adopted by cellists until the beginning of the 19th century. The cellist Mark von Skavig, who was professor emeritus at the University of Oregon and who now teaches at the Conservatoire Royale de Bruxelles, has conducted extensive research concerning the Baroque cello and its various bow holds. The main point to remember is that standardization was a concept far less important to the mind of the Baroque citizen. Cellos with four, five, and even six strings existed, along with a plethora of different bow shapes and bow holds. Von Skavik concludes that in central Germany during Bach's lifetime, it was a rarity for players of bass violins, an umbrella term that includes all types of cellos, to hold the bow with an overhand grip. The cellist and musicologist Mark Urban Smith, who is based in Adelaide, Australia, has also undertaken substantial research specifically concerning early cellists holding the bow underhand. He compared 259 pieces of art depicting cellists from the earliest known example of about 1535 up until the year 1800. He compiled these paintings, drawings, and engravings into two tables. The first tracks the number of instances of cellists holding the bow underhand, and the second tracks the number of cellists holding the bow overhand. Each table is organized into 10-year increments and is grouped by country. In examining Germany, since this would be Bach's region, one might expect to find an equal amount of underhand and overhand bow grips, or perhaps slightly one more and the other slightly less. Yet remarkably, from the year 1630 until the year 1730, there exists not a single instance of a cellist depicted playing the cello with an overhand bow grip in Germany. Naturally, there are dozens of depictions of cellists in those countries playing the cello with an underhand bow grip. While the sample size of 259 is far too small to reach the conclusion that no cellist from Germany played the cello with an overhand bow grip in that hundred year period, one cannot ignore the obvious signs that the underhand bow grip far outweighed the overhand in popularity during this time. In fact, Double bassists who perform today with an underhand bow grip are referred to holding the bow German style, while those who play the bass with an overhand bow grip are referred to as using the French style. The more one begins to delve into the deep world of art and literature from the Baroque period, the more one sees just how popular the underhand bow grip was at the time. In 1752, the famous flute virtuoso and composer Johann Joachim Kranz published a work entitled 
essay of a method of playing the flute transversely, which according to some is the most thorough treatise on any instrument to date. In it, Kvats provides an engraving of a scene in which a flutist is playing a concerto with a continuo group containing a cellist. That cellist is seen holding the bow with an underhand grip, about 30 years after Bach published his cello suite. In 1770, about 50 years after Bach published his suites, the English musicologist Charles Burney recounted during an excursion to Padova that he found it remarkable that Antonio Vandini and other Italian cellists hold the bow in the old-fashioned way, with the hand under. Two years later, while attending a concert in Berlin, Burney remarked that the cellist Marcus Heinrich Raoul performed a concerto in the king's court, which was well executed, though in the old manner, with the hand under the bow. Finally, an article from 1799 in the Allgemeine Musikzeitung, the foremost musical publication in Germany for over 200 years, describes in depth the cellist Johann Christoph Schepke's underhand bowls. The unknown author recounts that Schepke had the most accomplished control of the bow, achieved by holding his thumb on the frog of the bow, his pointer finger alone on the stick, and the other three fingers directly on the hair, using them to increase or decrease the pressure on the bow in order to produce the greatest power of the depths, or the sweetest oboe tone in the upper region. Upon discovering evidence for the legitimacy of playing Bach's music with an underhand bow grip, it was time to begin learning the sixth suite in this style. After an initial period, in which I struggled to make any sound at all that was halfway decent, the benefits of holding the bow underhand slowly began to emerge. Today's modern world places a great emphasis on power and volume while making music. This is not necessarily a negative development, as cellists today must compete with Steinrich grand pianos that are nine feet long and with large brass sections called for in massive orchestral works. Holding the bow overhand allows a cellist to use their natural arm weight through gravity to press the bow deep into the strings, projecting a large and powerful sound. If one were to attempt this amount of pressure on a Baroque cello with gut strings, the results would be far from pleasant. The motion of playing with an underhand bow grip is more akin to pushing the sound out from behind the cello. The strong impulse with an underhand grip is on the upstroke, beginning at the tip, which is the point of the bow furthest away from the hand. The strokes used are generally faster and lighter than those of an overhand grip. This is particularly advantageous with gut strings and when rolling the chords in the works of Bach. The last thing I would like to mention about the sonic qualities of the underhand bow grip is that of rhetoric. In the Baroque period, musicians placed a much greater emphasis on speaking through music and imitating the patterns of speech through musical phrasing. I will now demonstrate how playing a Baroque cello with five string sounds using both an overhand and underhand bow grip. I promise that I am not intentionally playing one version any better or worse than the other. Furthermore, I will not purport which version I believe to be superior. That determination I will let you all make for yourself.
underhand bogrif in mind? Certainly, Bach's intention in this matter is impossible to ascertain today. However, as von Skeevig surmises, Bach's ensembles most likely contained cellists playing with underhand and overhand bow grips alongside each other. Perhaps Bach preferred a cellist who played underhand. Or perhaps Bach was content simply to have his new compositions performed by a professional cellist, regardless of how they hold the bow. Nevertheless, I hope to have presented a case through historical evidence and sonic comparison for the value of learning and performing Bach's solo cello suites using an underhand motor. I would like to conclude this lecture by extending my thanks and gratitude to several people. First and foremost, I would like to thank my teacher, Dr. Eric Kuntz. Despite claiming that this was all out of his realm, he never gave up in aiding my search for the right bow angle, speed, and contact point to produce the right sounds. <laughs> His help and advice in teaching me this suite was indispensable, and I could not have done it without him. I would also like to thank Dr. Kenneth Slowick, who graciously allowed me to borrow his personal five-string cello, and who listened to me play different movements of the suite many times. I greatly appreciate his suggestion to allow Bach's harmonic motion to influence my pacing and agogics. I must also, of course, give a special thank you to my parents, without whose unending support I would not be standing here today. And last but not least, thanks to all of you for coming here tonight. Now let's take a ten minute break, during which you may all have some food and drinks while I tune the trouble. <laughs> Hopefully it will not take all of the ten minutes. <laughs> and I will see you all again shortly to play the sixth suite by Johann Sebastian Bach.